गुड मॉर्निंग नमस्ते एंड अस्सलाम वालेकुम आई एम आतिफ सलीम वन ऑफ द पैलिएटिव केयर कंसल्टेंट्स फ्रॉम शौकत खानम हॉस्पिटल पेशावर सो आई एम गोइंग टू बी द होस्ट आई हैव विद माय आई हैव विद मी एंड डॉक्टर हारून हफीज हु इज गोइंग टू शेयर दिस सेशन सो वेलकम टू द पैलिएटिव मेडिसिन फर्स्ट सेशन uh it's an again an honor for me to be part of this uh, 21st uh, shokat khanam memorial cancer symposium palliative medicine as you all know is a growing specialty in pakistan uh this year has been marked by palliative medicine uh being recognized as a post graduate training specialty so uh this we have kept as a main theme for this session the recognition involved a lot of efforts and of course there were challenges faced during this um process and during the development of the curriculum invest as you all know palliative medicine training program is very well developed uh they have well established uh, curriculum of palliative medicine training uh which has evolved over time so it has moved from paper based to web based training and this development and evolution required a lot of efforts and they had to face a lot of challenges so this is going to be the first talk by dr fiona rollinson uh who has been my teacher as well dr fiona rollinson is professor of uh, palliative medicine she is also a senior lecturer a clinical lecturer and program director of postgraduate uh, palliative education at the cardiff university in the uk uh, she also worked uh, as clinically as consultant palliative medicine for city hospice in cardiff so over to dr uh, fiona rollinson Hi everybody thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk around one of my particular um passions which is how we can design palliative care education programs that are effective that are fit for purpose and really that try to address some of the very understandable challenges that there are in this area at the moment i'm really delighted to be with you again virtually and again thank you for this opportunity So my experience so far has been in designing all manner of different education programs whether it by be by old fashioned looking at books um, whether it be by putting together packs of material and posting them out around the world which is what we did in 1998 to 2000 and about four before we went online for the card course I visited different parts of the world and helped to develop education in all different types of setting the resource poor settings of low and middle income countries where colleagues are immensely resourceful in what they can achieve with very little and in the more established settings of the western world and more recently of course with coronavirus with planning for education online and i think we can continue to be really strengthened by the resolution that is now nearly 8 years old well just over 8 years old where from the world health assembly palliative care education became a core component of developing palliative care services and this really underpins the the need the right the importance of palliative care education to be part of your program wherever you're working and the why is self evident isn't it even before the pandemic the need of palliative care um is immense and continuing to grow around the world but as a result of the pandemic with delays in diagnosis with changed services with the immense impact of bereavement and grief resulting from the pandemic um there is a lot of work that still needs to be done there is an urgent need to increase the number of palliative care aware healthcare professionals of all levels in all disciplines whatever 
sort of education you want to develop, you want to deliver, the patient and their family have to be at the centre. And what to teach? Well, there are curriculum there out there. The, the European Association for Palliative Care has developed a number of different curriculum and guidance and suggestions. Um, colleagues in countries around the world have developed their own national guidance um, and suggestions. A particularly helpful place to start can be the, w, the WHPCA, Worldwide Health and Palliative Care Alliance Palliative Care Toolkit. This is a resource that has been developed with colleagues from across different settings, different healthcare settings, but especially around low and middle income countries where resources are variable and diverse. Um, and it's got a very much a can do attitude. You can form a team, you can control people's pain. So it's a free resource available from the WHPCA website. There's also a trainer's trainer manual which gives you top tips on how to deliver your teaching, so I would thoroughly recommend that as a resource. The European Association of Palliative Care um, does really describes three levels, an approach, which really needs to be a core part of all healthcare professionals, but actually you could argue for our communities, our informal caregivers, just understanding when cure is no longer the aim of care. General palliative care skills for the majority of healthcare professionals, delivering palliative care across all different settings, and then of course the role of specialist palliative care. But if there is diversity across the healthcare settings, then the role of the specialist is very particular. It's for those few people with complex palliative care needs, but it's also about supporting the development of palliative care teams, being a resource for your local healthcare practitioners. Again, the European Association determines core constituents of palliative care, which then could be built into education systems. And they've developed 10 core competencies of palliative care, ranging through the holistic assessment to family and care needs, to ethical decision-making, to communication skills, and also to actually our self-awareness skills as healthcare practitioners delivering palliative care. It needs our own self-awareness for us to know when we too might need refreshing, when we too might need a break. And it's hard when the need is there in front of us and, and we need to and we want to be there every day. I work 150%, 150% of the time but there are times when I need to step away and I need to go and walk up a mountain, walk my dog, paint a picture, do something that helps me refresh and re-energise so that I'm again there for my patients and there for my colleagues in my teaching role. So what to teach? Think about your setting. Think about your context. Do you need to survey the learner group before you start teaching in order to establish what their priorities might be? Do you want to teach one session? Do you want to teach a collection of topics or a curriculum? Do you want to create a qualification or a certification in palliative care? And think around the variety of learning styles of the learner group. Some people learn by seeing, some people learn by listening. Some people learn by practically doing things. So the combination of different activities will help cement that learning and embed that learning into clinical practice. It has to be clinically relevant. And don't underestimate the hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum is the side effect of the education, lessons which are not openly intended or taught, but which are learned. And that's about your attitude, our attitude, as educators? How do we talk about our colleagues? How do we talk about our patients? Do we bring in members of the multi-professional team to teach with us, to role model what being part of a multi-professional team is all about? So who? So the who of palliative care education can be who are the learners, is it going to be undergraduates? Is it going to be postgraduates? Again, what's the priority for the setting in which this learning needs to take place? 
Is it a single profession? Is it a combination of professions? Single profession teaching can be very useful because you can really focus in on some of the profession specific issues. How to undertake a clinical examination, how to undertake a paracentesis, for example. However, multi-professional teaching will again help that team working, it will help the understanding of the different roles that healthcare professionals bring to palliative care. Palliative care is a team activity. It, it needs people of different disciplines with different views, but all focused on improving the quality of life for that patient. But who else might do teach? The policy makers, government, police, law, the narcotics board, carers, patients. Again, think about what are your priorities? It's very difficult to do everything all at once. What are your priorities for where you are working? And who are going to be the educators? Will we educate ourselves? Will we bring colleagues in? If palliative care is new to an area, having somebody inspiring that will really create curiosity, make people want to learn more, that can be very motivational. They need to know the topic. Ideally, it's having a clinical background if you're teaching clinical issues, just because some of this stuff in palliative care is difficult, isn't it? And actually being able to talk about what it feels like as you're about to break bad news can really empathise with the learners who are learning to do this perhaps for the first time. Can you collaborate? Can you work across different organisations, across different settings that brings more people in, that brings diversity of ideas? It can make things a very powerful learning experience and mitigate against some of the challenge that one feels being very isolated. We have to grow educators, identifying the educators of the future in the people that we're teaching is a really powerful move. A sharing knowledge is really important. And when, consider the needs of the learners. Do you need to have a regular commitment? A regular commitment is easier to build into people's routines. If you're too inflexible there in those topics, you need to have, you, you, you need to be able, to, you, it's a risk. You need to be able to put in the urgent topic on catastrophic hemorrhage, for example, if there's a carotid blowout from a head and neck tumour and the team really feels they need to be upskilled in that in order to help them for the next time it happens. Do you educate people before they qualify, after they qualify, as part of their professional development? Do you leave things very flexible according to need? The only trouble with leaving it that way is that palliative care has a tendency to be squashed out by the other specialties and the specialties with high tech equipment, high tech, new medication, death and dying and making that as good as it possibly can be is a difficult subject for some. Death is still viewed as a failure by some of our colleagues because all of their skills and expertise is in keeping people alive. That's what they're trained to do. We need those people. But we also need people who know when that move has to go from being a curative goal to being a palliative goal. And that's where that palliative care education is so important. Where, where does this, where does this education take place? Face to face is so vital. It's so energizing within a team, within an organization, locally, nationally, internationally, the possibilities are endless. And I think the easiest way to think about this without getting overwhelmed, because it is overwhelming, is just think, what will be gained by the mode of my teaching? So if I'm going to do this online, what will be gained by being online rather than in the same physical space? In general, what being in the same physical space gives which online doesn't give in quite the same way, is that sense of connectedness. And we know this now, having gone back to face-to-face -to -face teaching after two years of teaching online. It's that developing that community of learning, that community of practice. 
it's more difficult to do online. However, online reaches more people. And if you can't leave your place of work because you're the only person there, online events, virtual events, virtual teaching will suit you better. So what will be gained by the location? What might the disadvantages be? There's no perfect here. It depends on the topic, it depends on the context. So how are you gonna do it? Think of just being practical. Think of the practicalities and the necessary resources where you are working. Have you got physical space? Have you got a large physical space? Have you got small breakout rooms? Are you going to teach on the ward in front of people? Have you got the technology and the backup to teach online? Reflective practice is really an essential part of professional development. Our patients have got stories. Their relatives have got stories. We need to hear the stories. We need to think about them. We need to learn from them and then transfer that learning on to others and to new situations. A lecture on its own is not very effective at people retaining knowledge. So the Ken Miller's learning pyramid actually moves down from passive teaching methods to many more participatory teaching methods, discussions, doing, teaching others, all to be recommended. So briefly looking through some of the teaching techniques, observerships, people coming and watching you, being alongside you, can pick up an awful lot, can pick up a lot of hidden curriculum. Be a little bit careful because sometimes people can be very passive and you're not quite sure whether they've actually learned things. So making some sort of feedback event is really useful, but it is a way to expose people to a palliative care way of thinking. And one of these things is just thinking what aspect of care for the patient will be enhanced by this sort of teaching session. What do you want to achieve by offering a observership or going on an observership yourself? What do you want to achieve? One-to-one -one teaching, great, focused, lots of opportunities for feedback, direct observation of practical skills, role modeling by the facilitator. It happens in real time, but there are some things to think about around permissions, around observing unskilled practice and knowing how to manage that if you see that happening. And it takes time to set up. But again, it's a very powerful way of exposing people to palliative care skills. In consultations at patients and at the bedside, again, like one-to-one -one teaching, but directly in the clinical setting, it's really powerful. But there may need to be thought around permissions, around language, setting some ground rules for that uh, session to take place. Small group work is really sort of underpins a lot of palliative care teaching. It's terribly powerful. There's lots of peer learning. Think about the optimal size for you and your comfort as a facilitator. I know that small groups are around about six or eight people maximum for me is my best number. Anything more than that and I find it more difficult um, to keep control of and, and to really feel I'm being effective. It's communication skills though. You need to manage the group dynamics. Quiet people notice things. So if somebody is taking a lot of the airspace for you, then just very politely say, thank you so much. Can I just ask what this person thinks? So quiet people notice things. Role play as a virtual small group teaching is really powerful, particularly around communication skills but the psychological safety of that is terribly important. And that really needs to be worked on for role play to be effective. Big groups teaching lots of people exactly the same thing. Very powerful, very useful to get palliative care skills out there. But you need to know there needs to be some control over the knowledge. Um, and you, you can ideally make some interactive moments within the large group setting. Then of course the virtual learning space, e-learning programs, so a collection of topics, the massive online open courses, gets a huge amount of exposure to palliative care across continents. You can do it in your own place at your own time, but they can be very costly to develop. And they need meticulous planning, just the same as everything else. And they take time to develop. 
that there's a half free house, isn't there? Virtual learning, so sessions which can be form part of a curriculum and can be grouped together. You can record them and upload them, make them what's called an endurable resource. Yes, some spontaneity is lost, but again, bringing together people, particularly from remote locations, is terribly useful. But ideally, you have a second facilitator to manage chat and to manage any questions. But in all of these things, setting tasks for the learners to interact with the knowledge is really helpful and really important. Think about that Ken Miller learning pyramid and giving feedback on those tasks is important. That in itself is a communication skill. We need to be developmental. Of course, we need to correct wrong assumptions. We need to correct practice that is inappropriate. But we can do it in such a way that the learner or the group of learners will all learn from it. But it needs to be timely. It needs to be objective. So what can we control in an education session? We can control our preparation. We can mostly control the environment. We can control our own communication skills and facilitation skills, giving feedback. And we can start on time and finish on time. We can deliver what we say we're going to deliver. It's really helpful to talk to others about how you do this. Peer review of teaching is helpful. Building a network of educators can also be really helpful. Critical friends, critical reflections are helpful. And then always thinking about what we are doing, putting reflective practice into our own education. How do you know your teaching session has made a difference? How will you know? What would you change next time? Did you overrun your time? Did something that you planned just fall flat and not work? Why is that? So having your own um, professional development is terribly helpful. So the European Association gave a checklist for programmes in terms of have you thought about adult learning? Have you used a team? Have you thought about how you're going to use technology? Can you signpost people to clinical placement? Have you got a critical friend to look in on what they're doing? But the patient and the family have to be at the heart. So really, as a result of this talk, for us all as educators, including myself, having prepared these talks, what's our next step? What do we want to achieve in our education? How do we want to improve our education and develop our education further? This is a lifelong journey and very exciting. Thank you so much for letting me be part, inviting me to be part of the conference this year. And good luck to us all as we continue this journey. Right, uh, we'll have actually the question and answer session at the end of the talks. And uh, uh, it, this was very comprehensive uh, presentation. It covered a lot of as aspects of uh, why, what, who to teach. And uh, also uh, what I learned is the reflective press practice. Uh, actually, I had my part of training from the West and uh, and there are lots of opportunities there and of course there are challenges so this is going to be the theme of the next presentation that's going to be by Eva Gleason. Dr. Eva Gleason is the uh, clinical director for palliative medicine in Anurin Bevan University Health Board. Uh, her research interests include palliative care for non-malignant conditions and infection control issues in palliative medicine. Uh, over to Dr. Eva Gleason on challenges and opportunities in foreign training program. Good morning. It gives me great pleasure to be speaking to, this, to you this morning on the challenges and opportunities in a foreign training program. My name is Dr. Eva Gleason, and I am the clinical director for palliative medicine services in an Oyer and Bevan University Health Board in Wales in the UK. I'm going to speak about the changing face of palliative care in the UK, and in that context, the modern palliative care patient. And then going to explain what I mean by a foreign uh, training programme and speak about the opportunities and challenges for a non-UK based uh, doctor in, in a UK training programme. 
And I will then go on to speak about the Royal College of Physicians Medical Training Initiative. So in relation to palliative care in the UK, it has changed significantly since its inception back in um, the 60s in St. Christopher's. Our population is getting increasingly um, old. 7% of the population is predicted to be over the age of 85 years by 2041. 50% of the UK population uh, will experience a cancer diagnosis during their lifetime and cancer patients are living longer. 50% are living longer than 10 years. And we have a population of 2.5 million cancer survivors. The terminology, the vocabulary used around palliative, in, within palliative care has changed significantly. Services have often changed their name to palliative and supportive care. And there are specific early supportive care and supportive care services. Cancer survivors has given us the uh, increasingly focus on living with and after cancer. And with this, cancer journeys and palliative care journeys have become longer, more complex. Um, shared decision making obviously central to them, but expectations have evolved. And because prognoses are more uncertain, this has uh, created, uh, I suppose, greater complexity in supporting our patients. And I'm going to use a 52 year old uh, female patient of mine to uh, exemplify this. She has stage four adenocarcinoma of her bowel. She initially had adjuvant chemotherapy for six months, then went on to have cytoreductive surgery and hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy in a specialist, cent specialist center. That went very well. So she went on for 12 cycles of palliative chemotherapy and had maintenance chemotherapy after that, followed by further cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC. So she'd done very, very well and very much uh, focus was on, on, on living, on continuing to work normally, continuing to have a very normal life. She's a highly reflective, highly educated, uh, highly articulate lady who uh, then this year was admitted to hospital with, with um, symptoms of bowel obstruction. Um, she was taken to theatre and open and closed because she was found to have a frozen abdomen. Her consultant surgeon had commenced her on a short course of TPN um, and uh, we were introduced. So this was our first meet, meeting with her, um, at which time the focus was on for her, her nutrition, getting herself back on her feet, um, continuing on, getting back to normal life. Her bowel obstruction responded to minimal um, uh, conservative management and we spent most of uh, our conversations before she went home on speaking about nutrition and, and best uh, bowel, bowel and gut health to, to help her along. I did introduce the concept of advanced care planning and spoke about the about do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation. But that was very much an abstract con uh, concept for her because she felt that was way off for her, not something that she really needed to uh, fully take on board. Second admission, two months later, uh, abdominal pain and vomiting. She was treated with as, as intra-abdominal sepsis, as a CT scan showed uh, an intra-abdominal collection, but then developed um, a, a number of anterior abdominal wall fistulae. Um, at that stage, uh, while the hospice was offered at multiple occasions during her admission uh, for uh, some of the ongoing management, uh, she felt she needed to be in the acute setting so that she could have immediate access to IV uh, management uh, and, and uh, acute management for uh, further sepsis episodes or acute kidney injuries. Uh, our hospice. Uh, uh, is a standalone hospice and uh, one of the reasons she declined going there was because there are no resident um, on uh, call doctors so she'd be waiting for a doctor to come in to see her and she felt that that wasn't acceptable given that she still had a very good performance status and good quality of life that she wanted to make sure she had the most timely access to care. 
So uh, after approximately two months admission uh, with stoma and packing regimes um, uh, uh, balanced and with uh, titration of medications and syringe driver balance uh, to uh, have minimal impact on her bowel function because her bowel was functioning normally, but also to make sure that we reduced the output from her um, stoma, she went home. She continues to do well at home, but because of uh, tweaks in her syringe driver regime, which had cyclozine, ondansetron, octreotide, and morphine, um, she didn't want a second syringe driver. And we introduced lanreotide um, intramuscularly so that we could spare the medication in the syringe driver so that she wouldn't have so many attachments to her so she would still be able to get out and about with her family. During all this time, she continued to have monthly telephone oncological assessments uh, where her oncologist continued to indicate that, yep, theoretically, she could have further chemotherapy. During all of this journey, advanced care planning um, was, uh, we spoke regularly about it, but it was an evolving picture um, and a complex picture. So I think um, she had, you know, her, her case, I do think exemplifies some of the changes that I've taken in uh, place in palliative care. Uh, there were greater expectations, uh, greater uncertainty as to how she would do, because obviously she'd done really well with her palliative treatment so far. Um, so I now would like to talk about foreign training program and what I mean by that. So I'm talking both about uh, postgraduate uh, qualifications such as diploma and MSc courses, which mostly would be uh, available by remote, uh, through remote access and online learning, but uh, possibly with face-to-face uh, -face teaching blocks. And then I'm talking uh, uh, about uh, clinical placements in palliative medicine. So obviously any doctor from outside the UK would be able to apply independently uh, to uh, jobs in the UK, uh, like clinical fellow posts, specialty doctor posts, staff grade posts to get some palliative medicine um, uh, training, so experience in non-specialist training posts. If a non-UK based doctor wanted to complete the uh, full specialist training, so keeping, you know, you've heard a lot about that already today in this session. So uh, to become um, a, a specialist, a, a UK trained specialist in palliative medicine, um, the specialist registrar training program is a four year training program and the curriculum as uh, uh, as you're aware, has changed significantly recently. So our trainees in their four-year training program uh, train both in general internal medicine and in palliative medicine. And uh, uh, in, in that sense, they have a wider skill set uh, in order to be able to manage the modern palliative care patient. But obviously with this dual accreditation, this might be um, uh, attractive to doctors who want to train in palliative medicine, but are but are working in a country where palliative medicine is less uh, recognized, uh, less available. Um, and of course, I'm also referring to uh, uh, in foreign training programs to uh, bespoke training, uh, like the, the this the bespoke training um, supported by. Uh, the Royal College of Physicians Medical Training Initiative, and this is, is particularly um, applicable uh, for doctors in Pakistan, given that um, uh, Pakistan uh, now has uh, recognised palliative medicine as a, as a subspecialty. And I know you're going to hear about uh, more about that in the next talk. So in speaking to you about opportunities and challenges for trainees, I have uh, incorporated feedback from doctors who have either undertaken postgraduate training programs in the UK or have uh, worked clinically in palliative medicine in the UK or both. So I think importantly, the training is accessible. So postgraduate training um, qualifications are accessible. The, the teaching is provided remotely. The materials and the teaching that's provided is evidence-based. Uh, the materials are available online and the assessments are undertaken remotely. This means it can it can suit people in in lots of different countries and lots of different settings to be able to uh, 
gain access and, and gain qualifications in palliative medicine. Most of these courses include practical teaching experience, so face-to-face -face teaching blocks, which uh, mean that the, the doctor undertaking this training goes to the UK to actually under, undertake the face-to-face uh, -face blocks. This provides an invaluable opportunity for networking um, to build a support structure um, around uh, the future, their future developments and future working in palliative medicine. Um, that would be with the other doctors in the course, with the faculty members, with uh, other lecturers on the course. And of course, within these practical teaching blocks, often is included communication skills training, although during the pandemic, um, that was often delivered online and successfully. So I think anybody undertaking this kind of training or coming to work clinically in the UK as a non-UK based doctor, um, it will spark ideas. It will be provide much food for thought um, and, and possibly in, in bringing this back to uh, the, that person's own country of origin um, will spark ideas in terms of audit, quality improvement projects, research. Um, and I think that's a, a fabulous opportunity um, for all. Uh, one of the doctors who fed back to me who'd undertaken a uh, postgraduate uh, qualification said that that had provided an insight and deep understanding of palliative medicine, how to manage our patients, not only during their last stages of their illness, but also at any time in the course of their illness. And a doctor who'd worked in the UK in palliative medicine um, said that the experience is diverse. And since the program is very structured, it has made me work in a very connected environment where all factors focus on patient safety and benefit. But in relation to the challenges, um, so I think any doctor from outside the UK wanting to access palliative medicine training resources can do so, but often there's a cost attached and feedback from other from doctors has been that often access to uh, these uh, resources is blocked outside the UK. So that must be, you know, that's very frustrating and, and makes it difficult. In relation to undertaking a, a course of study, a diploma, an MSc, or coming to the UK to work clinically in post and palliative medicine, there are course fees attached, uh, visa costs, GMC registration costs, travel expenses, um, and, and they, they, they can be quite substantial. I think um, a lot of challenges have, uh, as I say, I've had feedback, and I think uh, uh, this feedback has been provided by a doctor who's worked in palliative medicine in the UK, and I think it actually captures uh, a lot of the challenges that a doctor from outside the UK would experience, especially where English is not their first language. So initially, due to the new working environment, new system, new colleagues, different expectations from patients due to cultural different differences, different guidelines to follow, and local legal policies, it was quite challenging. Everything was new. The language was different. The accent was different, making it even more complicated at times to understand. The theme of community palliative care was absolutely new to me. Therefore, it took me time to understand how it works and how I can make use of it for my patients. It was something very normal for people working around me, so they could not understand what I needed to know about it. So as I say, this encompasses a lot of the challenges that I've specified here, uh, the, the cultural, the country specific challenges. I suppose for people accessing an, an online training course, uh, 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 there's the added issues of uh, being in a different country, time zones. So if there's an online um, tutorial, at what time are you going to be accessing it? If there's political unrest in the country, does that mean then that internet services aren't available? Will that actually prevent access um, to fora, to online training materials? Um, and also fed back to me by, uh, by some doctors is the potential age limitation of applicability for the for uh, the courses that they've undertaken. And they were referring specifically to the fact that 
adult palliative medicine is uh, separated in the UK in terms of training from uh, pediatric palliative medicine. And while courses may cover both, it might be that the pedi pediatric blocks are specifically um, offered to uh, people who work specifically in pediatrics and only to them. Okay, and then um, feedback specifically from doctors in Pakistan referring to how the medicines they will have learned about may not be accessible in Pakistan. The, the settings um, are different. The legal framework is different and manpower is often a, uh, a restriction um, uh, for the applicability for the skills learned. Possible additional challenges, as I say, um, as leading on from what I've just said, the applicability of UK training in other settings. Uh, generally speaking, throughout the history of palliative care, we've needed pioneers, we've needed very strong voices. Um, we are still, I would say, a, a, the, 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 poor, the poor cousin specialty. Um, we have to fight very hard and we have to speak articulately and loudly in order to uh, represent our very vulnerable population. And I think it's this is an additional um, challenge for doctors outside the UK, bringing that training back to their own countries. As, as one of the people who fed back to me um, brilliantly put it, it needs rigorous efforts to bring awareness among the medical fraternity. I've talked about the modern palliative care patient. I do feel that, that, you know, that that's a very important challenge because in delivering the traditional model and in, uh, in teaching, uh, I suppose it's it's looking at the patient population that you're working with. Do they are they more like the traditional model, um, that or or are you dealing more and more with the modern palliative care patient? And that does create its own challenges. So that departure from the traditional model of care. Uh, point out the the difficulty with prognosis and the amazing um, implications of the advances in in treatment uh, treatments available. So this graph is of overall survival over years for patients with advanced melanoma, and all those different lines represent um, different targeted and gene based therapies. And what you can see is that the overall survival has the face of, of advanced melanoma has changed beyond re recognition. People are living so much longer. Um, and this was uh, really pointedly uh, obvious to me with, with a patient last week in a 69 year old lady in the A&E department who has advanced melanoma, but who's been living. And in, in, on meeting her, my conversation was the first one that actually mentioned advanced care planning and she had never interacted with palliative care services before, despite the fact that she has had metastatic spinal cord compression and she has advancing uh, metastatic malignant melanomatous disease in her spine. Um, so the face has changed beyond recognition. So I'm going to talk, I mentioned I talk about the Medical Training Initiative and the Royal College of Physicians have uh, medical training initiative team have kindly um, provided me with these slides for you. So this scheme supports international medical graduates seeking short term training posts in the UK for up to two years uh, through international partnerships um, and, and seeking to locate uh, well qualified trainees and linking them with UK hospital training posts. You can see the service on the right hand side of this slide that they offer. They offer help with GMC registration, tier five government exchange visa sponsorship. 
They'll offer uh, quarterly in, uh, in inductions in UK medical practice, a free e-portfolio access and free associate membership for uh, people undertaking these trainings, pastoral support for doctors in difficulties, and educational supervisors and peer mentorship support. There are two main ways that people access the MTI program. Um, so one is that, uh, they, that the MTI support them with their GMC registration and their visa sponsorship, but that they find their own placement, so they find their own jobs. And then the other um, way that the MTI may help is that the MTI might come into the country and conduct interviews with, with the um, uh, graduates' home country and match suitable candidates to UK posts and advertise both have a cost attached to the second. So this, uh, this route is more expensive. In terms of their global exchange, you can see the graph on the right here shows the top 10 MTI nationalities. Um, and as you can see, Pakistan um, is, is the fourth highest on this. So since the inception of the MTI scheme, uh, basically, there have been um, uh, approximately 200 um, graduates each year. And just to show that this graph shows um, from feedback from a survey that they did in 2020, as you can see, there's no responses from palliative medicine. So this is, this is um, a specialty where there's great uh, potential for MTI support. Uh, from their survey in 2020, uh, quality of training was found to be excellent or very good in more than 80% of cases. Uh, quality of supervision greater than 90% uh, uh, rated as good to excellent and greater than 90% of the doctors who fed back felt it would be uh, very much, uh, it would very much benefit their future career. Uh, the MTI uh, would welcome um, uh, any questions and if anybody wants any more information about the MTI the contact details are there. So in summary I've spoken to you about um, or explained what I mean by UK based training programs distance learning um, and clinical placements both being in the context of what I've wanted to cover. I've talked about the modern palliative care patient and how that in leads to increased length and complexity of disease journeys, and that in itself creates a number of challenges, but I do feel there are more opportunities. It's been a pleasure to speak to you today, um, and I hope you have uh, uh, enjoyed this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eva Gleason. Uh, now I'll move to the east and uh, from neighboring India, I have got, we have got uh, Dr. Seema Rajesh Rao. Uh, she is Associate Director, Education and Research from Bangalore Hospice Trust uh, in Bangalore. Uh, she is also Honorary Tutor at the School of uh, the UK. Uh, she would be talking about palliative medicine uh, training program in India, which is of course more advanced than ours. So over to Dr. Seema Rao. A very good afternoon to one and all. Uh, it is a pleasure and privilege to be here today. I would like to thank the organizers um, of Shaukat Khanam Cancer Symposium for providing me with this opportunity. I bring greetings from Bangalore Hospice Trust, Karunashraya. We are a 73 bedded inpatient hospice in Bangalore, uh, providing holistic evidence-based palliative care for patients with advanced cancer entirely free of cost. Karunashraya Institute for Palliative Care Education and Research is the training wing of Karunashraya. We offer multiple generalist and specialist palliative care training programs and internship opportunities to healthcare providers and to the public alike. My overview of palliative care education and training in India today will cover the current evidence of palliative care training in India today, the range and scope of the training programs that are currently ongoing, and what we envisage as the future of palliative care education in India. We are currently 
a nation of 1.3 billion population, the second most populous country in the world. With our increasing life expectancy and lifestyle changes, the prevalence of non-communicable diseases in India is on the rise, and so is the need for palliative care. It's estimated that over 5.4 million people in India need palliative care, but less than 1 to 4 percent have access to it. Even more worrying is that less than we have less than one trained palliative care physician per 1 million population. Given this, there is a need to prioritize palliative care training in India. What is the current evidence that exists about palliative care education? I did an advanced scopus search on palliative care education in India and only 11 studies emerged, of which eight were published original surveys and articles and three were uh, opinion papers. These studies were conducted across India and they explored the awareness and knowledge of palliative care among undergraduate and postgraduate medical students, among non-medical students, and among healthcare providers. No study explored the quality of palliative care education, the course curriculum, or the impact of training of palliative care. There were no studies indicating that this has not been a very much a priority area in India. What emerged from the, all the studies were the lack of awareness about palliative care among everyone, medical students, healthcare providers, as well as non-medical students also. Medical students felt uh, that end of life care concerns of their patients and both undergraduate and postgraduate medical students wanted palliative care to be included in their curriculum. Family physicians, primary health care providers, pharmacy, nursing students, social workers, and counselors all had low awareness about palliative care. Given this, it is not surprising that we are ranked 67th out of 80 in the quality of death index by the Economist Intelligence Unit. The quality of death index also highlighted that there is a short palliative care professionals in India and that palliative care education was not a norm in Indian medical schools. It also emphasized that it was not only healthcare professionals who had no knowledge of palliative care. Uh, it included uh, public as well as policy makers had poor awareness about palliative care. Surprisingly, this situation is not unique to India. When early career oncologists in China, India, and Pakistan were surveyed about the best, best ways of improving outcomes for cancer patients in their country, uh, the respondents from India and Pakistan did not consider palliative care as a necessary component of palliative care. These studies all show us that there is an evident gap in the healthcare provider's understanding of palliative care, and this gap can be bridged only via education. As we are all aware, the WHO Public Health Strategy for Palliative Care for, has also prioritized education as one of the key components that is uh, desired to achieve palliative care integration. Let's look at the road travel. What have we done since all this to improve palliative care education in India? The hospice movement in India started in the early 1980s, 86, with the establishment of Shanti Avedana Sadhan, a hospice in Mumbai. Initial training programs were sporadic and done in collaboration with multiple international organizations. In 1994, Indian Association of Palliative Care was established and systemic nationwide training was initiated only in 2018 by the IAPC. 
The current training programs in India are multiple and can be stratified into three levels. Level one training programs are entry level courses for healthcare providers, volunteers, as well as for the public. They are sensitization and awareness programs that provide basic understanding about palliative care and the application of the basic principles in the day-to-day -day practice. Level two focuses on a more generalist palliative care education. These are primarily structured for healthcare providers, mainly doctors and nurses who regularly deal with palliative care patients but are not part of the specialist team. These trainings equip the providers to deliver palliative care alongside their primary specialities like oncology or neurology or general practice. Level three trainings are university accredited residential postgraduate training programs in palliative care, which are offered in academic institutions. It is important to note that much of the training programs initially were initiated by philanthropic institutions or individual champions and did not come out of academic institutions. University late, almost three decades later. Thus, level one and level two trainings are mainly very unstructured, they are heterogeneous, they lack standardization with the duration varying from few weeks to a few days to few weeks to few months. I will discuss few of the popular training programs in each category. The certificate course in Essentials of Palliative Care or CCEPC is a flagship training program of the Indian Association of Palliative Care. Initiated in 2007, it trains over 1,000 doctors and nurses every year and is conducted biannually. Recruitment happens in over 50 centers in India, and the training is primarily done in two parts. Part A consists of a 15-hour contact session with eight-week distance education, and Part B is an optional 10-day hands-on training at a recognized palliative care institute. Any institute which aspires to store and dis dispense opioids will need one doctor who has been trained in the Part B to be employed with them. IAPC also uh, conducts multiple training programs for allied healthcare professionals at the entry level, like pharmacists, counselors, physiotherapists, and even for uh, volunteers that are standardized formats for these training program. Other agencies who offer regular short-term level one trainings include multiple uh, philanthropic organizations and palliative care centers like uh, Karunashraya, Institute of Palliative Medicine, which is situated in Calicut, Kerala. The Pallium India, one of the noted contributors in uh, palliative care education, situated in Trivandrum, India. MNJ Institute of Oncology in Hyderabad, and of course, Karunashraya. Mul <clears throat> Multiple online courses are also being offered in collaboration with international organizations. Um, the advantages of all online courses are that they are self-paced, easy to access, and multiple, um, the asynchronous uh, learning will be trained in palliative care. However, knowledge translation from online courses can be quite challenging due to lack of clinical supervision, mentoring, and hands-on training. Level two, Courses are primarily residential courses, which are conducted from one month, four weeks to six weeks, hands-on training that happens for doctors and nurses. Two of the very popular, um, there are multiple institutions that are providing these courses, as I mentioned before, MNJ in Hyderabad, IPM in Calicut, Talim India in uh, Trivandrum, um, also, Indo-American Cancer Association has a six-week certificate course in pain and palliative medicine, primarily for doctors, and these are conducted simultaneously across many centers in India. Lian Collaborative for Palliative Care has been conducting a novel uh, capacity building training program called the Cancer Treatment Centers 
uh, training program that establishes palliative care in cancer treatment institutes by training, education, and mentoring activities. Two of the very popular level two plus, as you can call them, uh, generalist palliative care education training programs have been the National Fellowship in Palliative Medicine conducted by IPM, Institute of Palliative Medicine, Calicut, and the MSc in Palliative Medicine by Cardiff University. The NFPM is a postgraduate training program in palliative medicine for doctors. This was started since 2004. It is a one-year distance fellowship program conducted jointly by Institute of Palliative Medicine, Calicut, and Christian Medical Association of India. Over 400 to 500 trainees, have, doctors and nurses have been trained via this program. And this was one of the initial courses in India. And I'm proud to say I'm an alumni of this program. For the past 15 years, Cardiff University Diploma and MSc program in palliative medicine has gained popularity over in, in India, supported by Commonwealth scholarships over nine via this program. This three-year course has had a significant impact on the landscape of palliative medicine in India and fostering promotion of research and evidence-based practice. In addition to this, in 2002, we at Karunashraya also launched a six-month university accredited certificate training in subspeciality palliative care, focusing on neuropalliative care and psycho-oncology. The icing on the cake, of course, has been the development of university accredited courses that have been mushrooming in India in the last few years. In 2012, Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai started the three-year postgraduate, postgraduate MD training in palliative medicine. You can see the first two pass-outs of MD palliative medicine, graduates of MD palliative medicine on the site. Currently, this has grown and there are seven accredited sites for training in MD palliative medicine with over 20 candidates emerging each year. Just last year in 2021, the National Board of Examination approved the Diplomate in National Board, DNB training in palliative medicine, which is considered to be equivalent to the MD training. We currently have six centers with up to more than 10 candidates doing their DNB. In addition to this, various oncological institutes are also offering one to two year residential fellowships for post MD, MS candidates, strengthening the level three palliative, specialist palliative care education in India. We have come a long way with regards to palliative care training in India since 2015. Collaborative efforts in the last uh, four decades has taught us many valuable lessons. From low demand, low supply scenario, we are now forging ahead. The government through the national program for palliative care has been systematically augmenting palliative care education in our country. In 2018, um, Principles of palliative care were included in the undergraduate curriculum for medical as well as for nursing students. With palliative care achieving a specialty status, many medical colleges are, colleges are establishing departments, vacancies are coming up, but there are very few qualified people to fill these posts. The gap between supply and demand is increasing. In this scenario, it is important to create alternative palliative care training pathways uh, to increase the palliative care uh, education in our country. This birthed the concept of Indian College of Palliative Medicine way back in 2017. The creation was stalled due to lack of funds, 
and also due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, in 2022, the Academy of Palliative Medicine was established in partnership with Indian Association of Palliative Care, Suprajit Foundation, and Bangalore Hospice Trust for Karunashraya. The aim of the Academy now is to now streamline the palliative medicine training in our country. It aims to develop a pathway for integration and accreditation of all existing non-specialist level one and level two palliative care training programs. It aspires to create a level three competency-based PC education, palliative care education pathway for professionals with postgraduate degrees in other specialties so they can move on to providing full-time palliative care. It will also provide a pathway for non-specialists who have been working in palliative care for a long time over to get a nationally valid level three qualification. It will also uh, provide opportunity for non-medical college institutions like hospices to participate in specialist palliative medicine training and also facilitate the development of verticals of palliative, subspeciality palliative care, like ICU palliative care, kidney supportive care, et cetera. We are currently working on this front. The Indian Association of Palliative Care has been working patiently to transform the landscape of palliative care education in India. We hope palliative medicine will emerge as one of the significant specialities over the next decade or so, with several subspecialities emerging from it. This vision is reflected in the theme of our conference this year, Metamorphosis, the Emergence of Subspeciality Palliative Medicine, scheduled to be held on February 10th to 12th, 2023 in Bangalore. The 30th conference of IAPC will have national and international faculty deliberating on the integration of palliative medicine into various specialties like cardiology, pulmonology, nephrology, neurology, oncology, and critical care. The last day of the conference will host discussions on research and education by pioneers in the field of palliative medicine. We invite you all to register for the conference and send in your abstracts. Together, we can make a difference. Let us join hands to improve the quality of palliative care in our subcontinent through collaborative efforts in education, training, and research. Thank you. In the end, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of the following mentors. Dr. Naveen Salins, the pioneer of palliative care education in India. Dr. Sushma Nagar, Sushma Bhatnagar, the president of IAPC, and Dr. Nagesh Sidma, the medical director of Karunashraya. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sima Rao uh, from Bangalore in India. Uh, so now we'll, we'll move on to Pakistan. Um, we have Dr. Harun Hafiz. He's my teacher and guide. Uh, he is a consultant in palliative medicine at SKM Lahore. Uh, he has worked very hard to develop the field of palliative medicine and uh, promote training for nurses and doctors at both the undergraduate and postgraduate level in Pakistan. He's developed a, a postgraduate curriculum to initiate the training in palliative medicine in the country. And this is what he is going to talk about. Over to Dr. Harun Hafiz. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Atif, for the too elaborate introduction. Um, I'm going to start off with, um, it was lovely to hear about the palliative care training in, in the West and especially in India. And whilst I've always believed we have a better cricket team, I think we'll have to accept that they have a better palliative medicine team than us and a better training program. Um, Pakistan, obviously, is at least in my opinion, about 50 years behind the West in palliative medicine development, and at least 20 or 30 years, as you can well see, behind India within this region. And if you noticed um, amongst the graphs where they were talking about palliative care provision, you would have noticed that uh, most of the studies now do not even feature Pakistan in the ranking when they are ranking palliative care provision, because it is just an accepted fact that there is no palliative care in Pakistan. 
um, but we intend to change it. Um, we want to improve it, and um, I see no reason why we cannot do it. Um, we here in Shaukat Khanum have palliative medicine as a specialty, uh, special uh, separate specialty within the Department of Medicine since 2008. Um, and before that, even in 1994, when the hospital opened its doors, um, one of the first medical directors um, was a palliative care physician. And um, we had a palliative care service in the 90s, but then he left for um, uh, greener pastures in the West. And then there was a huge gap. And then in 2006, I joined. And in 2008, we formally started palliative care in Pakistan, or Shaukat Khanam at least. Um, obviously, uh, my talk is only going to focus upon um, how we work towards developing a um, curriculum for palliative medicine in Pakistan and what were the challenges that we faced, keeping in mind that it was a new specialty and there were a lot of roadblocks to getting palliative medicine recognized. Um, Post-graduation in Pakistan, um, you know, we've talked about level one, level two and level three training. I'm only going to focus on level three training at the moment because we are actually talking about level three training as specialist postgraduate palliative medicine training. And in Pakistan, postgraduate medical training is um, done through two tracks. One is the university track and one is our College of Physicians and Surgeons of Pakistan track. Um, and um, CPSP has MCPS programs and has FCPS programs and universities have MD and MS programs. Um, as an example, we have written the number of years for each program, but I mean, it's different. There are FCPS, which are over five years, and there are MD and MS programs, which are over four and six and seven years even. So these are the broadly the main two sort of tracks to go down if you want to do a specialist postgrad qualification in Pakistan. Um, then obviously there is the academic side of things where the, the VPs, um, which can provide MPhil and PhDs degree. Um, what is the challenge? when you are trying to introduce a new specialty in a, in a country where there is no such specialty or where, where it hasn't existed in the past, is the first thing is designing a curriculum. Um, then obviously there's an issue of recognition of the specialty by the appropriate um, um, college. Um, there's an in, uh, issue of um, uh, having enough institutes for training. Then there's an issue of having a, a question bank for having an examination thing, then there's an issue of training and having enough supervisors as we talked about train the trainers thing. And then um, that all is good, you can have a curriculum, but if no undergrad and postgrad trainees or your potential customers or your potential applicants are not even aware of palliative care, as we saw in the study, that um, aspiring oncologists, only seven out of 50 surveyed in Pakistan, thought that palliative care had a place in an in, in, in oncology treatment. So, I mean, if you talk to cardiology trainees or pulmonology trainees, which are well-recognized wings of non-malignant palliative care, you'll probably find zero will think that palliative care has a role in pulmonology or cardiology. So that is also a huge challenge. And then, of course, the recruitment. So when we talk about designing a curriculum, um, we didn't want it to be too tedious. So we stuck with a two-year program. Um, we made it a supra specialty, so you could sort of, you had to do an FCPS in another branch, which I'll come to, and then you could come into this. Now, um, whilst we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, there's so many curricula out there, you could have, you know, we have the American uh, National Boards curriculum, and then we have the UK Palliative Medicine curriculum, we have the Indian one, we have the Singapore one. So since I had trained in the UK and I had a lot of links with UK palliative care specialists, I had worked there and with the Royal College. So I chose to um, follow the Royal College uh, curriculum for palliative medicine. Um, but then the it's, it's not e as easy as that. You can't just copy and paste everything because the list of challenges in Pakistan is very diff different. The patient um, population is very different and therefore, um, you have to make sure that your curriculum is around Pakistan and Pakistan's issues. And that is what we tried to do. Um, then um, I never thought that it would be so difficult to get College of Physicians and Surgeons to agree. And I remember one of my first uh, meetings about eight to 10 years ago, I had to actually spend an hour explaining what palliative medicine was. And this we are talking of the college itself to try and defend why we want to establish this as a specialty 
what will it bring to the postgraduate um, sort of a dashboard in the country and what sort of uh, expectations do we have in terms of it being a popular specialty. So this was a huge thing that um, uh, meant a lot of people did not know, there was no awareness and therefore um, uh, at the time when we first spoke to them, Shokat Khanam was the only place where we had formal palliative care and obviously that was outrightly rejected in that meeting because they didn't want to have a single institute. And then over the years, we had Aha Khan develop a very strong team as well and uh, Shifa in Islamabad and therefore we had a case to go back to CPSP and try to convince them to um, give us a chance to develop this. Um, now, back and forth, long, long story short, eventually in 2021, um, uh, the CPSP Council agreed to recognize um, uh, palliative medicine as a separate specialty. Uh, most of their conditions, for example, having training centers in, in the north of the country and the south of the country were met, and therefore they finally agreed to take this thing on. And then for about six months, it took us to get the curriculum formally vetted by the council and signed off by the president of CPSP. And in about December 2021, we received formal notification that palliative medicine will now be a specialty in Pakistan and it will be um, possible to do an FCPS in palliative medicine in Pakistan. Um, but then the ne uh, next challenge came, which was how to um, get an institute recognized for palliative medicine. Um, obviously, uh, my natural choice was to support the case for Shokat Khanam to become the first training site in the country, um, uh, which they agreed. But the normal protocol for CPSP inspection is that if they are coming and inspecting some uh, place for um, uh, endocrine training, they will normally get the uh, people who are specialist endocrinologists as well as faculty members for endocrine for the College of Physicians and Surgeons to come and do the inspection. So whilst everybody agreed to come and do the inspection, the next challenge was they kept asking me, you can't inspect your own institute. So you need to tell us and give us names of people we can invite because we do not have enough palliative care people. So obviously, naturally, I spoke to my colleagues in Aachan who were very supportive and agreed to take the time out to accompany CPSP council members to uh, inspect Shogat Khanam. And we had Shogat Khanam approved um, uh, for this uh, training. And finally, the ball got rolling for um, starting the training program. Um, and when we thought we would be able to advertise for recruiting trainees, another stumbling block came up that although the exam logically will not be held before two or three years, but we need to have an MCQ bank of at least 500 questions. And again, I had to go back to those two, three people um, I'm working in the country in palliative care to help me make about 500 MCQs so that we can submit. And um, then the rule by CPSP is that once you submit the MCQs, uh, somebody else from the same specialty has to review them. So there was nobody else to review them. So the two or three of us who submitted the 500 MCQs were the two or three people who were reviewing the same MCQs as well. So I have submitted about two, 300 sub MCQs and I reviewed the same MCQs and we used to get paid 1000 rupees for four hours to doing that, which was a huge amount of money. And we were served tea and cakes, but eventually now we had the MCQs ready. We had one supervisor um, ready, which was myself, and we had one institute ready, which was Shokat Khanam Lahore campus. So then eventually um, CPSP agreed um, for us to uh, start it. Now um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges that Aahan has faced, and I think Atif is online and he can talk about those as well. Um, it was lucky because I was already a supervisor for internal medicine, so I had the workshops done and I just changed my specialty from medicine to palliative medicine. But for somebody new to become a supervisor, you need to do workshops. And with COVID and everything going, there's a huge backlog in CPSP. So workshops are delayed. And I think people, it's taking supervisors at least a year or two years, as far as I've been made aware, to get all those five workshops done. So there's a significant delay. Once you have um, done the workshops, then obviously there's a scrutiny, which is usual, nothing extraordinary. Um, but then you are ready to go. And as far as I'm aware, and I'm really looking forward to it, but I think Aachan is also now ready to go and 
launch their fellowship in the next six months or so. I think Atik can clarify that further. Um, but at the moment, there's no awareness. I see a few trainees here. There is no awareness of what the program looks like. So um, you are uh, supposed to enter this training program after completing an FCPS, either in general internal medicine or family medicine, um, uh, which is similar as to what UK postgrad specialist training in palliative medicine is, that people who have done the family medicine track or the general medicine track can both enter it. Um, so uh, that's the first thing. That's the first step. It's a super specialty as far as CPSP definition of specialty is going, although I think it is a super specialty, but not most would agree with that. But anyways, so that's how it will be structured and it will be a two-year fellowship post um, FCPS general medicine or family medicine. Um, and then we very proudly launched our program and expected about 500 applicants, but we had only one applicant who was only there because I kept calling her again and again and again. Um, and we managed to blackmail her husband into making sure his wife joined. <laughs> so eventually we managed to finally have one applicant. Um, so it was a very tight competition for the two posts advertised. Um, and there was a very tedious recruitment process. And after a lot of scrutiny, we thought we will choose her and we'll go embark on this formal program. Um, but yeah, it does happen. We have a trainee now. Um, there is a, obviously a general lack of awareness and of, people keep coming back to me, especially the hospital administration, because this was my baby for the last eight years. And I'd been talking to the leadership again and again about the necessity of having a curriculum. And now this is the best stick that they can bash with it with because they've invested so much money, which I don't know what the money was and so much energy into getting this recognized, but we don't have enough applicants and we don't have enough applicants because People are not aware about this. People are, it's, it's, it's not a very glamorous specialty. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty emotionally exhausting specialty in my opinion. And um, therefore um, that's problem number one. And problem number two, if you think of it from a trainee perspective, when they choose a specialty, they want to choose a specialty with lots of job opportunities within and outside the country. Outside the country, I can assure you there are many job opportunities, but within the country, while there are no palliative care services in the country, we're still not at a stage where the medical associations in Pakistan, the medical fraternity in Pakistan is actively talking about provision of palliative care as a specialty or, or, or a feature in normal hospitals, in general hospitals and things like that. And therefore, um, if somebody was to do a postgrad training in palliative medicine in Pakistan and they wanted to stay in Pakistan, they would be looking at about Indus, Shifa, Aga Khan, Shokat Khanam, probably the best five or six hospital chains of the country, but not much options in the government sector at, or public sector at the moment in terms of getting jobs. Um, and therefore, I think that is that is always going to be a big, a big, big problem with palliative medicine in Pakistan. Um, for the next 10 years, attracting enough people towards this. I think once the public sector starts, uh, opens up departments with this, this will happen. And it's a catch 22 situation because when I speak to people in the public sector about having palliative medicine specialists um, uh, in their hospital or palliative medicine departments in their hospital, they always say, oh, but you do not have enough specialists who will we recruit. And then when we go to train specialists, the trainees will always think, oh, there's not enough job prospects, so where do we go? So I think as with any new thing in this country, specialist palliative medicine training is going to take some time, uh, maybe another five to seven years to become much more smooth. But the main thing is that all of these um, efforts have now resulted in a formal FCPS being available. So that's actually the first step that we could have taken in making sure that we have this. But um, it's still a very difficult journey. We're going to have difficulty in recruiting um, trainees. And um, I think it's, it's, it's a matter of realization that even if you are not practicing palliative medicine full-time, there are no specialties where you will not be encountering that. Everybody has a right to die with dignity. And um, that's essentially a core focus of palliative medicine, 
but the traditional palliative medicine, the modern palliative medicine, as we've just heard, there's a huge focus on supportive care. There's a huge focus of long-term follow-ups with cancer patients. There's a huge focus of long-term follow-ups of heart failure, neurological conditions, and pulmonary conditions. So therefore, it's a very interesting and a very broad field, which is going to take its time in getting to where it is. Um, and in the end, I would just like to say that life is pleasant, that hopefully will be more peaceful, at least if you're living in Pakistan. And it's the transition which we are all suffering, which is the most troublesome for us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Harun. Nearly there. Uh, so we are having the food for the thought. We are going to have the food for the tummy very soon. So, so moving on to the last talk uh, for the session, uh, this is going to be by Dr. Muhammad Atif Fakar. Uh, Dr. Atif Fakar is a consultant, physician, and uh, founding chief uh, of the session of palliative medicine in uh, uh, the Department of Oncology at uh, Aga Khan University Hospital, Karachi. So over to Dr. Atif Fakar. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Atif, for the very kind introduction. And uh, I just wanted to extend uh, my sincere appreciation to Dr. Kashif and Dr. Harun as well for inviting me to talk about uh, this new initiative that we had taken uh, at Aga Khan University Hospital, which was uh, establishing palliative oncology tumor boards and keeping in line with the theme of postgraduate training in palliative medicine today, um, I'm going to share the important role that palliative oncology tumor boards may actually uh, play uh, in training our, our fellows uh, in, in the subspecialty of, of palliative medicine. Just a slide of my disclosures, I've got no conflicts of interest, and I've got no relevant financial relationships to disclose. Uh, some of the learning objectives that we'll be covering in my short presentation today is really highlighting the academic and clinical benefits to setting up a palliative oncology tumor board, uh, talking about the uh, strategic planning, the operations, the designing, the format of a palliative oncology tumor board, uh, recognizing the impact that it can have uh, in improving the quality of postgraduate training in palliative medicine, and then briefly share our experience of of setting up the Palliative Oncology Tumor Board at Aga Khan University Hospital and the, the challenges and the barriers that we encountered in that process. So I'm gonna start off with the, with the multidisciplinary tumor boards. Uh, all of us that are there in the room right now um, and our uh, colleagues who have joined us virtually um, are, I'm sure, very familiar with tumor boards. They've uh, either are actively involved in attending multidisciplinary tumor boards, or they've at least uh, attended a few in the past. And the, the evidence is crystal clear. Uh, the tumor boards, they do improve accuracy of diagnosis and staging in cancer. They improve the adherence to clinical practice guidelines. They uh, have been shown to improve uh, the uh, survival of patients, patient satisfaction. There's been evidence that suggests that there are significant changes to the treatment plans that are developed after a discussion in the tumor board. And there is also evidence that shows that there is a reliance on tumor boards for clinical decision making as well. And gone are the days now when we used to have general tumor boards because now things have become very site specific and we're, we've now uh, developed site specific multidisciplinary tumor boards that are improving the quality of care that we're providing. And uh, just to share with you, um, our experience at Aga Khan University Hospital. Uh, at present, we've got approximately 34 to 35 uh, site-specific multidisciplinary tumor boards. We've got dedicated adult and dedicated pediatric uh, tumor boards, uh, some of which are weekly, fortnightly, but the majority of them are conducted on a monthly basis. And, and you can see um, very prominently displayed our palliative oncology tumor board right in the center. Uh, it's been about a year now that we've started our palliative oncology tumor board. And, uh, and I'm very excited to share with you some of the, the uh, unique findings um, and the, the benefits that we've been able to obtain uh, since then. 
um, all of my colleagues before me have uh, driven this message home um, where we keep talking about how the evidence is uh, very positive in terms of early integration of palliative care and how it leads to better clinical outcomes, leads to longer survival, leads to less episodes of depression. So that evidence uh, is irrefutable. But the problem is that despite us wanting to integrate palliative care early on into standard oncological treatment, having that desire to integrate palliative care early on, there's little or to no involvement of, of palliative care in the traditional tumor boards. In fact, uh, this is a very interesting systemic review that was done back in 2016 that looked at the 27 studies. And what they found was that there, there were only two studies that actually mentioned that palliative care physicians were involved in the tumor board discussions themselves. And only five uh, allied disciplines uh, that were involved. So it, it highlights a huge deficiency while we want to integrate palliative care early on, uh, avenues to do that are, are very few. Uh, so the Palliative Oncology Tumor Board is one of such avenues that we could explore when we're talking about integrating early palliative care into standard oncological treatment. So then the, the question that comes up time and time again is, how is this different to the MDTs that we are all very familiar with that we've been practicing in palliative care? And how is a POTB uh, different to that? Because we're not strangers to care conferences. We're not strangers to multidisciplinary team meetings. Um, but there are a few differences that I wanted to highlight over here. And the first difference, of course, is the composition of the Palliative Oncology Tumor Board and the stakeholders that are involved um, there is certainly some overlap, but as I'm going to share with you in the next few slides, there are uh, significant differences in terms of the composition of the team and the stakeholders that are providing the treatment plan recommendations. Uh, we, um, uh, especially um, in, in, in palliative care, we are already providing uh, multidisciplinary team meetings, team conferences, but generally these are for patients who are either admitted to the inpatient palliative care unit or the freestanding hospice centers or uh, patients who are admitted to uh, home hospice or home-based palliative care services. Rarely are we conducting such meetings for patients uh, who are coming to us just on a purely outpatient uh, basis, patients who are still ambulatory. The majority of these patients are still on active oncological treatment, and these are the patients that um, benefit the most from a palliative oncology tumor board. And uh, what I will share with you in the next few slides is that the disease-directed uh, treatments that we're focusing on right now, they kind of supersede our specialties in palliative medicine. And often we're looking at oncological treatments that would have the most benefit to improve the quality of life. And those are the recommendations that usually come out of these palliative oncology tumor boards. And the last and very important distinction is the fact that in most centers where palliative oncology tumor boards are already an established practice, they're not run or coordinated by the, on the palliative care team. In fact, they're run and coordinated by the medical oncology or the clinical hematology team that's dealing with malignant hematology. So as I shared with you, the composition and the stakeholders of the palliative oncology tumor board, and what I'm sharing with you right now is the existing model that we have in practice at Aga Khan University Hospital in Karachi. And there are two very important things that I want to bring to your attention. So the first thing would Dr. be- Dr. Atifakar, can you hear us? Yes, yes. Uh, actually, your voice is breaking. Can you turn off your video, please? Probably sure. that would work. Sure, sure, I will do that. Uh, can you hear me better now? Can, can, can you hear me better now? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay, okay, thank you. So, so the two distinctions that I wanted to share with you are number one, the inclusion of subspecialties such as medical oncology, radiation oncology, clinical hematology, but also uh, bioethicists and clinical ethicists that are part of this team as well. Uh, in addition to that, the second very important uh, point that I wanted to bring to your attention 
is the inclusion of postgraduate trainees, not just in palliative medicine, but in all the other subspecialties um, and, and having their presence uh, as part of the team, the attendees for the palliative oncology tumor boards. Um, now, noticeably, what we're seeing um, uh, that is lacking over here, something that we're working on, but is, is a standard of practice in palliative oncology tumor boards uh, across the globe, is the inclusion of the surgical oncology team, uh, also the inclusion of the interventional radiologist. Um, and uh, uh, they also include financial counselors and financial planners uh, to kind of minimize the financial toxicity that's associated uh, with oncological treatments. And then the two subspecialties that we clearly see that are uh, deficient over here is the um, social worker, the discharge planners, um, and the, the chaplains. And, and all of us who are in the room right now are very familiar with the reasons why both of these uh, allied disciplines, unfortunately, are not present. And that's a discussion for another day. The uh, Dr. Atif Fakar, there seems yeah. to be a network glitch. Uh, we still cannot hear you clearly. Um, I, I'm, I'm really very sorry to the audience. What we would do is, uh, if you can cut short your presentation, please, uh, that would help. To some extent, what we would do is, uh, uh, in the second part, we can have part of your uh, presentation as recorded. Can we do that? Uh, cer certainly, Dr. Atif, certainly. I, I will stop over here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now we'll move on to the, the question and answer session. So if we have questions from the audience. Any question? There seems to be a pin drop silence. So if we do not have any question, uh, we are going to end the session and uh, we'll have the recorded uh, presentation from Do Dr. Atif Fakar in the second session. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Have a nice evening. <laughs>